That summer there was war again, the Northmen raiding the western coast, and Arthur's legion rode forth to battle, this time riding at the head of the Saxon kings from the southern country, Cerdig and his men. Queen Morgoth remained in Camelot. It was not safe to take the road alone to Lothian, and none could be there to escort her. Turn late in the summer, Morgoth was in the women's hall with Guinevere and her ladies when they heard the trumpets from the heights. It's Arthur returning! Guinevere rose from her seat. Immediately all of the women dropped their spindles and clustered around her. How do you know? Guinevere laughed. A messenger brought me the news last night, she said. Do you think I'm dealing in sorcery at my age? She looked around her at the excited girls. To Morgoth it seemed that all of Guinevere's ladies were but little girls. 14 and 15, who made every excuse to leave off spinning. And now the queen said adultly, Shall we go and watch them from the height? Chattering, giggling, gathering in groups of two and three, they ran off, leaving the dropped spindles where they had fallen. Good naturedly, Guinevere called one of the serving women to put the room to rights, and at Morgoth's side, falls at a more dignified pace to the brow of the hill where they could see the wide road leading up to Camelot. Look, there's the king! And Sir Mordred riding out of sight. And there's the Lord Lancelot. Oh, look, he has a bandage around his head and uh, his arm is in the sleigh. Let me see, said Guinevere, and pushed him aside while the girls stared. Morgoth could make out Gwydion riding at Arthur's side. He appeared unwounded, and she drew a sigh of relief. She could see Cormac back among the men, too. He had been to war with all the men. He, too, seemed unheard. Gareth was easy to find among them. He was the tallest man in Arthur's whole company, and his fair hair blazed like a halo. Gawain, too, at Arthur's back as always, was upright in his saddle, but as he came near her, she could see a great bruise on his face darkening his eyes and his mouth swollen as if he'd had a tooth or two knocked out. Look, Sir Mordred is handsome, one of the little girls said. I've heard the queen say that he looks exactly as Lancelot did when Lancelot was young. And then she giggled and dug her neighbors in the ribs. They clung together, whispering, and Morgoth watched, sighing. They seemed so young, all of them, so pretty, with their hair silky soft and bound in fleece and curls, brown or red or golden, their cheeks soft as petals and smooth as a baby's. Their waist so slim, their hands so smooth and white. She felt suddenly wild with jealousy. Once she had been more beautiful than any of them, now they were nudging one another, whispering about this night and that. Look how the Saxon knights are all bearded. Why do they want to look shaggy like dogs? My mother says one of the maidens said she was, she was the daughter of one of the Saxon noblemen. Her name was something barbarian, which Morgoth can hardly pronounce, Alfred or something of that sort. That's a custom man without a beard. It's like kissing another maiden or your baby brother. Yet Sir Mordred shaves his face clean, and there is nothing maidenly about him, said one of the girls, and they turned laughing to Ninian, standing quietly among the women. Is there, Lady Ninian? Ninian said with a soft laugh, All these bearded men seem old to me. When I was a little girl, only my father and the oldest druids ever went bearded. But even for Bishop Patricius now wears his beard, said one of the girls. I heard him say that in heathen times, men deformed their faces by cutting their beards, and men should wear their beards as God made them. Maybe the Saxons think it's so. It is but a new fashion, said Morgoth. They come and they go. When I was young, Christian and pagan alike shaved their faces clean, and now the fashion has changed. I think not it has anything to do with holiness either way. I doubt not that one day Gwydion will wear, wear a beard. Will you think less of him than he has? The younger woman laughed. No, cousin. He is the same, bearded or shaven. Ah, look, there rides King Kyrdig and others. Are they all to be guests in here at Camelot? Madam, shall I go and tell the stewards? Please do, my dear, Guinevere said, and Ninian moved towards the hall. The girls were shoving one another to get a better view, and Guinevere said, Come, come, all of you, back to your spinning. It is unseemly to stare at young men this way. Have none of you anything better to do than talk so immodestly about the men? All of you now, be off with you. You will see them this night in the Great Hall. There is to be feasting, which means work for all of you. Okay, but they went obediently back to the hall, and Guinevere sighed and shook her head as she walked back at Morgoth's side. 
In heaven's name, was there ever such a lot of unruly girls? And somehow I must keep them all chaste and under, under my guidance. It seems they spend all their time gossiping and giggling instead of minding their spinning. I am ashamed that my court should be so filled with empty-headed and immodest little hussies like this. Oh, come, my dear, said Morgoth lazily. Surely you two are fifteen once. Surely you're not such a model maiden as all that. Did you never steal a look at a handsome young man and think and gossip about how it would be to kiss him, bearded or shaven? I do not know what you did when you were fifteen, Guinevere flared at her, but I was behind convent walls. It seems to me that would be a good place for these unmannerly